remember that when we talk about something that you know about, you'll be here to, to fill us in on what you know. So he's getting hooked up to our newfangled microphone. And <laughs> Can you guys hear me if I didn't go with the microphone? Yes. Can everybody hear good enough? I just assume. Okay. Not do that if I don't have to. Okay. And if you can't yeah. at any time, just yeah, raise your hand, up. wave at him. Okay. Well, like Bonnie said, my name is Denny Weiss. I'm from Bellevue. I originally grew up in Burlington. I worked 35 years for the Iowa DNR and fisheries research over to Bellevue on the Mississippi River. I retired just about nine years ago. So I tell guys now I've got a good life like most everybody here in this room. We've got 365 days vacation and we don't have to worry about how many more vacations I've got weeks that I've got left for hunting or trapping or fishing trips. I grew up in Burlington and I used to commercial fish when I was in high school and junior college. I, I've fur trapped since I've been probably 10 years old. I still, I'm back into this week, I'm getting ready to sell my fur. Unfortunately, our fur market is terrible for what it was back in the late 70s and 80s. I mean, when I graduated, I went to two years of junior college at Burlington, Iowa. Then I went to two years at Iowa State University. I've got a degree in fish and wildlife biology. But anyway, when I got out of college in 1979, that's when our fur market was probably the best ever. Our raccoons were $60, good fox were 80 or 90, and muskrat six, eight dollars. And back in those days, our minimum wage was about three or four dollars an hour. You know, in the late 70s. So that was used to be some big money. But anyway, one of the couple things I've came to talk about today, like I say, this is like this is one of the foot traps I use yet today for beavers and this is the kind of traps those guys were using back in those days this is a, a double long spring trap they're they're heavy but i tell people beavers are big animals my personal biggest beaver i've ever caught probably seven eight years ago weighed 90 pounds you know so normally a big beaver is 50 or 60. a, the, a little bit about the biology of a beaver i tell people a, a normal beaver colony this year our beaver prices are real low the only thing pretty much our beavers are getting used for today for our section of beaver in the Midwest is for the hats um, chum, thing that they do. They're using them for cowboy hats. They're used shaving our beaver furs and using that under fur to press it down and make a good Stetson or cowboy hat. Man-made felt doesn't hold up as near as good as, as beaver fur does. I'll pass this around. This is. Like I say, I'm just getting ready to market my hides here at the end of the week. I'll probably, we don't have very many fur buyers around. For about eight years, I was on their board of directors, which was the coolest thing ever. From about 2008 till 2015, I was on this board of directors with uh, NAFA, they were called North American Fur Auction. They were based out of Toronto, Canada. About two or three year, times a year, they would fly me up to Toronto for our board meetings. It used to be the biggest wild fur uh, warehouse in the world for auction. We'd have Russians, Chinese, uh, all nationalities come to bid on fur. Unfortunately, about five years ago, that fur company went bankrupt. So, because it was owned 25% by the trappers and 75% by the mink ranchers. But anyway, this is a, a what we call a raw beaver fur. A lot of guys say trapping today are gonna just capture their beaver, maybe even sell their beaver in the carcass or in the round. They're not going to be worth very much money because if I was a fur buyer, I've got to pay somebody to skin that beaver. i got to pay somebody to flush that beaver and then to stretch it. So somebody that just traps a beaver and takes it to a fur buyer, a whole beaver, and he might get $5 for a fairly big one. It won't even make his gas money. A skinned out beaver, he might get $8, $9. I'm going to I clean skin mine as I skin them with a real sharp knife. Then I've got, you, you can't hardly see it, but we've got real small little one inch nails. I put these on a four by four sheet of plywood. It's got holes drawn on its circles. I'll see what size this beaver needs to be and start nailing on that oval on my four by four sheet of plywood. I've got a granddaughter that helps me pull the nails off, so I tell people I like to give her 50 cents. If she takes her, there's usually about a hundred nails on a, on a beaver. So she's my little trapping partner. She goes fishing. She's six years old, but she just loves the outdoors. So anyway, I tell guys, get ready to sell these. But normally they would look at this beaver and measure it from the head to the tail and across and add those two measurements together. 
and that's how they would size up the beaver. Say if I was a Russian, I could look on the internet, know what size of beaver I'm looking for. This one's good because he has no blemishes in his fur. I usually back comb him. But really, I'm kind of wasting my time today. I just too old fashioned. I like to take care of my fur when I do catch it. That's why I clean skin them, dry them. I've got them combed out. But when I go to sell them here, probably Friday, and drive them up from Minnesota, the guy's going to put, I've got 50 beaver right now to sell. He's going to put them all on the scale and weigh them. They're basically buying beaver these days by the pound. And I just called him the other day to see if he's going to be around Friday. I said, Jason, what's the price of beaver right now? Ten bucks a pound, he said, for dried beaver. So these little beavers weigh just a little over a pound. This one here probably sells for about $12. My bigger beaver, they weigh 50, 60 pounds. They weigh about two to two and a half pounds. So they're going to be worth about 20 to 25 dollars. So between my little ones and my big ones, I should average about $15. So still not a lot of money, but it's better than right now we're selling raccoons for six, eight dollars and muskrats for a dollar or two. It's just not a whole lot of money going. But anyway, this is what we would call a raw. This is the kind the, the trappers, the mountain men, would probably market their beaver this way. Skin them out. Once we dry them like this, the only thing I could keep this all summer or the moths or the bugs and insects would start nibbling at this fur. That's why sometimes I'm sure the mountain men would use the brain of an animal. I've never done it before, but they say pretty much the brain of any animal has enough capacity to tan the skin. So guys that like tan a, a deer hide with the brains of the deer. And today that would not be the thing to do because now we're fighting that CWD, which is chronic wasting disease in our deer. And that would be the worst thing ever to try to work with the brain tissue and rubbing that on your deer hide. But anyway, you could use that for the beavers. And I'm sure the mountain men somewhat did that. Feel free to raise your hand and I'll out a question and that is, I go, this I'll pass around. This is, because I used to, I still do at times, I used to do about 80 to 100 school talks when I was DNR talking on turtles and fish and furs and trapping and all that to school kids. Because if I could tell people that's our future for the day, we need to get them involved in the outdoors. But this is a tanned beaver that I've sent off to commercial tannery. They've made it soft and pliable. And this, I'll just pass this around. You guys can see all this, feel how nice a beaver is. This, on the other hand, this is, this is kind of, Hell, this has probably been around, I'd say, 10 to 15 years now. We'll pass this around, but this is a pe this is a pe or this is a beaver, but this is what they call plucked and sheared. That beaver being pulled around, they take this one and run it through a machine that pulls out all those long guard hairs and all that's left. This is his winter primeness fur, his under fur. So every animal has under fur and guard hairs. He'll lose all this hair in the summertime because he doesn't need it for warmth. But in the winter time, he's going to grow this thick under fur. This is the under fur that they're going to use for the hatter industry to make these cowboy hats. So essentially, my my raw beaver here that I showed you, they're going to shave that, exclude the long guard hairs, the small under fur. Just pass this around. This is so soft. I wish I had a shirt or a bedspread made out of that stuff there, because it is. When you guys get to feel that it, it's super light. And, but now one of the things they'll use in the modern day fur trade with our winter caught beavers, if they're a good enough quality to pluck and shear them like that, now they're going to dye in pink, yellow, purple, blue, all kinds of colors, make a lady a fur coat, and nobody knows she's wearing real fur. But yet it's super soft, it's lighter weight, it's better than any man-made synthetic fur. And like a lot of people say, I used to do a few, a few of these talks out the Iowa State Fair, and some of the girls that kind of run, get the schedule set up, said, Danny, I don't know if I want you to talk about trapping. It's kind of a controversial subject. You know, this is 10 years ago, and it still is. I said, most people don't realize that fur is a renewable resource. You know, any fake fur that a person has on the collar of their coat, guaranteed, that's made out of oil, synthetic <coughs> components. And I tell people, oil is not renewable. Someday, Probably not in our lifetime, but in our kids' or our grandkids' lifetime, we might be rationing oil. And I tell people, why do we want to waste our oil to make teddy bears or fake fur for our coats when we've got real fur that's just like an acre of farmland? We can harvest 200 acres of corn every year off that acre of ground 
but we can't let it sit idle for 10 years and think we're going to harvest 2,000 acres or bushels of corn off of it. And our furs are the same way. Back in the 1970s, when we had the best fur market, we used to harvest 300,000 raccoons from the state of Iowa. Now we're harvesting about 20 to 30,000, and we've got distemper, rabies. In fact, the DNR, I think, coming up this next year is talking about having no season on coons, so people can just shoot them year-round because they're getting to be such a problem for our farmers and disease problems. But anyway, get back to our beaver. I want to tell you a little bit about the the, the biology of a beaver. Most of all, I've got a lot of farmers calling me this year, wanting me to trap beavers on their farm or on their crib. Because I tell people, beavers and farmers don't go together very good. Beavers like to dam up the stream, dam up a, a culvert, floods their cornfield or their bean field. That's worth lots of money to the farmer. So he does not like to see the beaver. My good farmers that I've trapped on a lot of years, they know enough to call Denny and let me drive in the field and get those beavers caught. Some of the new farmers that I haven't dealt with before call me and go, Denny, hey, I've got a beaver dam on my, my uh, lower creek there, and I've had a guy in with a backhoe and he's poured out a couple times. I said, you're wasting your money. As fast as you can tear it out, that family of beavers is going to build it back that next night. Within two nights, they're going to have it built back again. The only way to get to solve your problems, essentially, is to harvest or trap those beavers. Because nobody, you know, years ago the DNR used to live trap some, but we don't, nobody would allow us to take a beaver onto your land and release it, or in another section of the river. We've got beavers coming out our ears right now, because we don't have enough market for them, nobody's trapping them. It's a lot of work, low pay, traps cost a lot of money. But anyway, I tell guys, in a normal colony of beaver, you're going to have the male beaver and the female beaver. In the spring of the year, usually April, early May, female's going to have three to five kits, small beavers. She's going to keep those with her for two years in that colony. The next spring she has another litter. So a full colony of beavers is going to have the adult male and female, usually about 40 to 60 pounds. They're going to have three, four, maybe five one-year-old beaver. They're going to weigh about 20 to 25 pounds. And then she's going to have two, three, four, depending if none of those got killed or whatever, that are going to weigh about 30 to 35 pounds. Then following on the third year, that female and male are going to start biting their two-year-old beavers and telling them to get out of Dodge. They're on their own. Because it takes, a beaver has to be two years old to be mature. So essentially in March, early April, the mom and dad's going to start biting those two, three, four beavers that are two years old, tell them to skedaddle. They're going to start swimming up and down streams trying to find a mate. So now this male found a mate. Uh, female that's two years old, fell in love just like today being Valentine's Day. They said, oh yeah, let's go down and swim down this river. This island right here, this looks like a nice place, lots of willows, that's just like a candy factory for, for beavers, there's piles of willows, of trees. Oh yeah, let's set up our household on this island. Oh no, along comes a 50, 60 pound male beaver, starts biting them, fighting them, says get out of here, this is our island. They swim down river, same thing, another beaver bumps them out of there. So I tell people it's nature's way of these two beavers swimming up small little streams going, oh yeah, nobody's around here, we got plenty of good food, let's start our dam, we're going to have our first litter of beavers and we're going to start our household here. So that's what happens with the beavers. I as a beaver trapper love the spring. Because now, as I tell guys, it's like us taking our 15, 6, because a beaver lives to be about 6 to 10 years old. So in relation to us, a 2-year-old beaver is about like a 15-year-old or 20-year-old. It's like us taking our 15-year-old boys or girls to Iowa City or Des Moines and say, hey, been nice knowing you, but here's $100, good luck with life, we're gone. And that's what happens to these 2-year-old beavers. They know enough about how to build a dam, they know how to cut trees for food. And all a beaver eats is the outside of the bark of the tree. And they love stuff that's about a half an inch or an inch in diameter. That's like candy to them. So I tell guys that's why the tips of the trees have those small tender branches, but a beaver can't climb. So that's why he sits on the ground, gnaws that tree down until it falls over. Now he can go over to those nice tender treetops, get that, and pull them into the water, sit there and eat that nice tender bark at the tops of the trees. But anyway, getting back to those beavers, 
in the spring of the year, we've got lots and lots of two-year-olds swimming all over creation, trying to find maids, set up new housekeeping. I, as a trapper, with, when you know what you're doing, you can trap a lot of beaver that time of year. Because here's the thing, if this was, say, here's a creek, a beaver's going to crawl out of the water two, three foot, get mud in its paws, and go up on the bank and dump all this mud in about an eight to ten inch big pile. It's kind of like a dog going around the neighborhood, peeing on every tree and fire hydrant in his area, saying, this is my area. You other dogs stay out of here. This is what beavers do to mark their territory. They put this big pile of mud. Each beaver on either side of its anal opening has a caster gland and an oil sac. On each back foot, they have a hollow claw that they put down there several times a day, excrete the oil, and preen themselves to put oil in their fur to help keep it waterproof. But this other sac, called the caster sac, they'll climb up on top of this and excrete some of that, and that's a unique odor only beavers have. So I, as a trapper, and the mountain men used to do knew this same technique. We save the caster sacs out of these beaver, dry them, cut them up, mix them with some glycerin to keep them antifreeze and preservative, a little bit of water, and I've got my own bottle of that. When I make my own mud pile, I'll put a little of that caster up there. Now any beaver swimming down the stream smells that, and he's going, huh, I wonder who is up here on the bank. When he comes up, he steps in one of my traps right at the water's edge. We usually give him a long cable, about 10 to 15 foot of cable. He slides out to deeper water. It's on an L lock, so he slides out here to another stake, but it kinks and he can't go back to shore. So he's going to drown very quickly. So that's basically how we trap beavers with the foot traps. I brought along, because I'm getting ready to, to market it, like I was telling Bonnie, about two years ago, this is a caster sack. This is probably from about, I'd say, a 25, 30 pound beaver. Not very big. These will get about three times this big if this was off a 50 or 60 pound beaver. And this is a, a semi-dried caster gland. Two years ago, this stuff here was worth about 80 to $100 a pound for me as a trapper. Right now, I just called my fur guy, and it's definitely <laughs> supply and demand. Two years ago, our good beaver hides were only eight to ten dollars. Nobody was hard to trap beaver. They didn't have very much caster on the world market, so that's why it was worth eighty to a hundred dollars a pound. Now our beaver hides are worth fifteen, maybe twenty, twenty-five dollars. More people are trapping beaver. Now we've got lots of caster on the world market. I just called him yesterday, and now it's fifty dollars a pound, which is still pretty good money. This weighs just a little over. Uh, about an ounce and a half. I weighed it this morning. So basically, if you got $50 a pound, 16 ounces, about $3 an ounce is what it's selling for. $3 an ounce would be $48 a pound. But some of my caster glands are weighing six, seven, eight ounces. So some of those are worth $20 to $25 just for the scent gland out of that beaver, excluding the fur. So, but here's the coolest part about this. Most people don't realize. Like I say, the beaver, the mountain men would definitely save these casters. Right now, for 50 years, 100 years, our market for these beaver casters is guys making lure. If I, I trap a lot of coyotes, so I grind up this caster, put that in my coyote lure, because dogs or cat, I mean, any animal that's a predator loves to smell this beaver caster. So I'm going to use this for my personal fox or coyote lure. I'm going to grind it up for my beaver lure. But for our markets today, when this is sell, sold on the world market, we've got people from all over the world bidding on this. They're going to use this in food additives. I've read up on it, sometimes in different liquids or different kinds of food. The Algonquin Indians used to grind this up and put it in their cigarettes or their tobacco. And even like Campbell cigarettes, some of the cigarette companies 30, 40 years ago would use dried beaver caster in some of their tobacco and, and cigarettes for a sweeter flavor. But right now, today, like I was telling Bonnie, I've studied up on this stuff because I, as a trapper, are pretty involved and I, I like to be able to mark. A lot of trappers just throw this away. They don't even know. I mean, I'm going to have about, when I sell, I've got four to five pounds, so I'm going to have two or three hundred dollars. A couple years ago, I had 11 pounds of it, got eleven hundred dollars just off my beaver caster you know, off of about 80 beavers. But here's the, the real unique thing, especially the majority of this group here today is 
is ladies. I love to tell this story when I go to high school and talking, and maybe she's the high school teacher, but anyway, I like to tell them our, our market for this is, is lures, but it's also the other biggest competition is the lady perfume dealers are in on this. This is used as a base in expensive ladies' perfume. And they're going to what they call tincture it, just like I do as a trapper. I'm going to cut this all up, put it in a maybe a half gallon um, jar, fill it up mostly with water, put some glycerin to it, maybe a little sodium benzoate as a preservative, and just let it sit for two, three, four weeks. I'll shake it up every once in a while to get it in suspension. That way, that caster, I can, it will go further. And that's what lady perfume dealers do with this. They use tincture beaver caster like this. So, but they use it in their, their perfume. But here's the coolest story of when I used to do these talks. About 15 years ago, my caster market went from 25, 30, that's what it used to be for a long time, went from 25, 30 dollars a pound down to about 10 dollars a pound. And I was just sick and I, I talked to the uh, fur guys and I said, what's going on? Well, the lady perfume dealers have backed out of our market so they're no longer competition. They're using man-made synthetic components now for the base of their lady perfume, just like man likes to do to circumvent nature. Well, they did that for about five or six years, then they started doing some more studies. Most of their man-made components they were using turned out to be carcinogens, cancer-causing agents that they were using in ladies' perfume. So now the, that's why our caster's worth a lot of money again. All these perfume dealers came back into the natural market of beaver caster. And now we've got a, a good, healthy market for our beaver caster. So I tell people it's just like what man likes to do is come up with additives and whatever and think they can circumvent nature and it's come back to bite them. Sure. What are the, the, the word fox and coyote natural predators of the beaver? There, oh, yeah, yep. And, and that, you bet. Are there, is there a population down? Is that part of the problem? No, or? no, we got lots of, not very many fox because the coyotes have killed off our fox in the last 20, 30 years. But our coyote population is out the roof. Yep. That's what we should be having. Well, yeah, but I, I used to have quite a bit of, here. my coyotes were $30, $40. Three, four, five years ago, I used to catch 30 40 no, This year right. I caught it's 15 just to stay close to Bellevue. Yeah. I, bet, I bet I can't get $5 off my good coyotes. I'm gonna go tan them, give them away to some of my farmers, tan coyote fur, and then I'm gonna sell some. I've got people that would pay me $40, $50 for tan coyote. But a good question or a good concept she brought up, that's why I tell people beaver here in the Midwest is such a problem. The beavers used to have the black bear, the wolf, and the mountain lion. We used to have all three of those here in the state of Iowa. Those are natural predators on beaver. We no longer have them. Beavers have very few diseases. So they're reproduced, they don't practice birth control. We've got beavers <laughs> every year. You know, and we laugh about that, but some of the states out east, like New Jersey and some of those, They've pretty much taken away all the foot traps and conibears for trappers. They want them to use nothing but live traps. Very inefficient way to try to catch them. Another bad thing with beaver, when they poop or excrete in the streams, their, their feces, that's what gets giardia. Giardia is a, a intestinal, if you, drink, if you drink water out of a stream and there's beaver anywhere up the stream that's pooped in it, you're probably going to get giardia. Essentially, it's diarrhea and vomiting from it. You know, so now some of those states out east that are taking their water supply out of streams are having to put more chemicals to it because they have so many beaver in their watershed or their water supply system. You know, so it's just, it's a nightmare of, of what's happening with our beavers because we've taken away essentially our predators on them, you know. Let me talk one more. Here's another one I'll pass around. This is a... It's kind of a limited hit or miss market, but this is a beaver's tail. I used to get dollar, two dollars if I would just cut the beaver's tail off. There was guys that they would flip them open, fillet them, dry them. But this one's been commercially tanned and dyed. They use this beaver tail to make watch band to, for watch, wrist watch bands and for billfolds. It looks kind of like snake skin or alligator skin when it's there. And this hat here is about probably 30 years old. Danny yeah, made this when I used to go ice fishing and whatnot, but this is out of beaver that I made myself, tanned it, cut it out, but it's got to be a really super warm day or super hot, cold day to ever be able to wear this, you know, but it's kind of neat that I trapped it myself and tanned it, turned it into a hat, and 
Like I told my wife, we didn't bring it along today, but probably 30 years ago when beavers were at their lowest market ever, I had a lady make her a beaver coat. Took about 10 beavers, and it's turned out, but there again, as Teresa tested, it's got to be a really hot, cold, cold day to wear it because it's such a warm coat, you know. So, trying to thank the good about everything. Has anybody got any questions for some of the stuff Denny talks about? It sometimes get talking too fast on things, I suppose, but. Sure, you bet. Is there a season for beavers, or can you come Yep, out? you bet. Good question. Our season starts the uh, first Saturday in, in November, say the 5th of November, and it runs till 15th of April. So I've still got, and like I say, that's why I'm kind of excited to get on the spring beavers, except we're all, and I can attest that too, we're in our gold years, and I've got to get cataract surgery <laughs> on my left eye here in a week. So that's going to put Denny out of commission for a couple of weeks while I'm recouping, because Doc said I can't lift anything, and keep infection or so it wouldn't be too good to be putting any ripping <coughs> lock or any of that in my eye when I get cataracts. So that's going to put me out for a little bit. You bet. Is the uh, meat edible? Yeah, good question. Yep. We love to eat beaver meat. It's, I just, I catch so many. I mean, now I, this year I've caught 50. But say five, six years ago, for probably 20, 25 years out, my goal was always 100. I'd catch 100, 125 beavers. I love to eat those 20 to 30 pounders, just save the two back legs off them. The whole beaver's edible, but the back legs are just like nice roast and cut all the fat off and put them in a roaster and put some maybe bacon over them and beef bouillon and potatoes, carrots, and onions, and it makes the best beef roast. Meat just falls off the bone. And the wife can attest, we used to have friends over, you know, husband and wife, and the, the husband knew me good, and he goes, hey, and I say, hey, you guys want to come over for beaver, you know, on Sunday or whatever? Yeah. And the husband goes, but don't tell my wife what we're eating. You know? <laughs> so it was so funny. We'd be there, you know, and they'd be eat halfway through it, and it tastes just like the best. Because the biggest trick with any wild game, I mean, I we sh I shoot black bears, and we eat bobcat. You know, we've got a bobcat season. Bobcat tastes just like the best pork you've ever had. It's a white meat. But anyway, getting back to the beaver, well. Do it, and about halfway through the dinner, the guy's wife would usually say, "Guys, Trees, you really did good with this beef, with this, you know, roast beef." And and Trace goes, "No, Denny does most of the cooking." And then the wife looks at me and goes, "Guys, Denny, that is really good." And the husband's shaking his head like, "No, don't tell her what we're eating." Like, oh yeah, but I can say, if you didn't know what you're eating, you'd think it was the best tender roast beef. A lot of times, I'll shred it and just barbecue it make sandwiches out of it, but that's good. My, my, uh, my one brother used to trap uh, snapping turtles. Oh, yeah. And uh, anyway, the, the meat tastes just like chicken. Yep. And on it was really good. Oh, yeah. yeah I, used to, I used to catch about three to 5,000 pounds of snapping turtles years ago. I had commercial fish yet. Turtle trap, you bet. And beavers are somewhat like territorial. Yeah. So there's like Many, many of the beavers are beaver mouse, like by the Mississippi, like on the way to Sebula. Are those all beavers? So the, on your oh, oh, that's a good question. Those are muskrat. Those are muskrat huts. Because sometimes yep. I see them working, but I never really for sure. Yep. Okay. Because they're because they've got usually they're making them out of arrowhead or sedge or cattail. In the fall, usually September, October, those muskrats are cutting all that, mounding it up, then they swim underwater and hollow out the center of that. So then the winter, they're living here, but they dive under under the frozen ice to go dig out their bulbs and come back up. Do you trap those? Oh, yeah. Any traps are not everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there again, you know, we've got lots and lots of muskrats on there. Yeah. But there, there again, they're worth this year about $2. You know, and gas is so expensive. And I caught 100 muskrats in about a week. But, I mean, 20 years ago, when they were 5, 6, 7, I'd catch 1,000, 1,200 muskrats. In the year, you know, the muskrats are real small. They're about the size of a rabbit. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Muskrats don't. But they're real prolific. A female can have two or three litters during the summer. So just a couple muskrats can really multiply. Where beavers are a lot slower in their reproduction cycle. Oh yeah. Oh, we got lots of otters. Yep. Oh yeah. Our limit is three otters every year. Yep. I think this year Teresa and I caught five. You know, she traps with me, and so each trapper, yeah, each trapper can catch three otters. And there again, we probably need to increase that quota because we don't have enough trappers anymore. 
And now halfway through the season, I'll get farmers calling me, hey, Danny, I got otters eating all the fish out of my pond. I go, well, I've already used my three permits. Three should use third three. We can't catch any more otters. So I, I here in about another month, I love doing this. I've done it for probably 20 years. So I'm going to ride over with the Green Island Wildlife guys. They're gonna, we're going to go over to Hawkeye Tech Community College. They're going to have college students from Kirkwood College and Hawkeye Tech. Usually 30, 40, I'm about this size of group. I do a little talk on trapping the fur bear biologist. He's out of Clear Lake, Ben Sevelsizer. He'll give a PowerPoint on our otter populations and our bobcat population we've got in the state. But then we'll divide these kids up. We'll maybe have, no, I bet this year we'll have 30, 40, 50 bobcat, 30, 40 otter that's either been trapped. And say like this year, I turned in two bobcats. I can only keep one. My wife, Therese, can keep one. I caught another bobcat in a foot trap. I let it go. But two of them were in conibears and dead. So I turned those in to our conservation officer at Bellevue. So here in March, we'll meet at Hawkeye Tech, a bunch of wildlife guys as college kids. We'll show the college kids how to skin them and help them skin them. And for me, it's good hands-on for them. We've done it for a lot of years. If it's a female, we're usually going to cut it open, take out its uterus, cut that open, and you'll see black scar, little round spots. So say if I was a female otter, they're going to cut my uterus out, count that I had three pups last year, because when they were pregnant on their uterus, when they delivered their pup, it leaves a little round black spot on their uterus. So that they can count them either on a female bobcat or a female otter. Say that this one had three or this one had four. Then we're going to pull an incisor tooth out of that female, put it in a bag, and they're going to cross-section that, like I used to do with fish scales or fish spines be able to read it like a tree ring and said this female otter was four years old and she had three pups the previous spring. So they can get a lot of bio, good biological data knowing that they got to be about two years old before they first start reproducing. We can find out they're having about two and a half bobcat kittens, you know, per female. And so it's a lot of good biological and it's pretty cool for these college kids to get hands on to be able to do this stuff. So. And then we sell those furs and put that money in our fish and game trust fund for the DNR. So it's kind of all a good win-win situation. But there's where I've been after Vince, the uh, fur bear bouts. I said, Vince, you need to raise our otter quota. You know, it's a waste for me just to catch a couple of dead in my beaver traps and have to turn them in. And I know most of these farmers that are calling me, and I don't have no tags to go catch them. Boom, they just shoot the otters and let them sink in the bottom of the pond. You know, I said, Vince, raise that quote up to five or six or seven. I like Missouri stocked otters about six, eight years, ten years before Iowa did, and they've had a season before we did. Our first otter season started in about 2008. And so, because I tell people, we pretty much extirpated our otters at the turn of the century here in Iowa, but it was a combination of things. Our rivers, otters are a site feeder, mostly feeding on fish. I'm kind of getting off the subject here, guys. You probably are better ready to kick Denny out of here. But I tell people an otter's a site feeder. He's feeding on mostly fish, crayfish, and clams. Our farmers were not doing a good job at the turn of the century, farming up and down the hillsides. Our streams turned muddy. So if this was a stream and I was an otter trying to find food, I can't hardly see. That was one of the problems with our river otters. They didn't have good conditions to try to feed in. Their furs were worth lots of money. They were over trapped, no seasons on them. So pretty much by, say, 1920 or so, we no longer had any otters left in the state of Iowa because of our farming, because of over harvest. But pretty cool enough, probably the 1980s, we started trading turkeys. We had lots of turkeys in Iowa. Our wildlife guys in the winter would cannon net these turkeys, put them in boxes. We were trading them to the state of Texas. They were wanting to stock turkeys around Texas, and they were getting otters out of Louisiana. So we were trading two turkeys to the state of Texas, and Texas would buy live otters out of Louisiana to bring into Iowa. So we released them all around the state, hoping maybe we'd make a comeback. Now we got otters coming out our ears, just like Missouri does and everybody else. But we've got better conditions. Our streams are a lot clearer. We've got seasons and bag limits on them. You know, we manage them. And so I can tell guys there are any animals neat, but just like our deer. If we, if I, say if I was a DNR biologist and I said, hey, we're not going to shoot deer for the next five years. 
What would our highways look like? What would our cornfields look like? You know what I mean? <laughs> you can't just say we can't harvest nothing for, like, say, deer or turkeys or, or otters or beavers or anything, you know. And so that's what makes me sick as a trapper. We have such a terrible fur market right now. Our coon market is really dependent on Russia. And look at what's happening in, and Ukraine. Ukraine buys coons. Russia does. China does to some extent. But Russia's always been our number one coon buyer. So with the war going on, that's just, if I was a Russian fur buyer, I'm not going to go buy $2 million worth of coons to make in the coats. I don't even know what our, and their Russian ruble is, is junk. You know, it's really gone downhill. Sure. Uh, what about coyotes? You said they were exploding. What's going to happen there? I see people hunting them. Yep. It, they're a tough animal to control. Very, very adaptable. You know, very smart. And they're like I tell people, I had a good coyote market two, three, four, five years ago. It's going to get 30 40 50 dollars. But now, I hate to say it, but the animal rights people, our best coyote usage was called um, Canadian goose. It was a, a down parka, nylon. They would put a coyote rough parka on it, on the collar of it. They were our number one coyote market around the world, buying thousands and thousands of coyotes. The animal rights people have boycotted them and made such a fuss. Canada Goose says we're not putting coyotes on our winter parkas no more. So now our coyote market just tanked. We can't hardly sell them right now. So, yep. Yeah. What about the minks? Are they prevalent? We got a lot of wild minks. But wild mink right now is a, a male's worth about five to six dollars, and the female's two or three. Terrible. Because there's what kind of started our fur market on downhill slide probably 10 years ago. A little bit like our farmers can overproduce our mink ranchers. I tell guys, when I was on that fur board for eight years flying me to Toronto, it was so cool. I got to, I learned a lot off their fur graders. You know, I told guys, we'd sell three to 500,000 raccoons at each sale. We'd have about three sales a year in Toronto. Say all you guys were Chinese, we'd have a big buffet line for the Asians, and you guys are from Russia and Germany and Italy, we have another big buffet line that auctions would last three to four days to auction off all these furs, but we, uh, our auction company would really wine and dine these people. We'd take your husband or your kids out to malls or shopping with our vans while you were bidding at the auction house to buy and all that stuff was good, but I tell people our ranch mink, we used to produce about 50 million a year about 10 years ago around the world, and our world supply could eat those up. But then ranch mink started going up and up and up, just like $7 corn or $15 soybeans. Everybody's going to doze out some more ground or try to get some more rows of soybeans in. Our mink ranchers, more and more guys were jumping into the market, trying to up their production. About five, six years ago, we were at 100 million mink. They doubled their production. Way too many mink, and that flooded the world's fur market. And these ranch mink are like a small otter, big, gigantic, beautiful, everybody matches, colors way different than our, our wild mink. So when they started buying mink for $20, $30, they used to be $100, it, it, our wild furs went down to two. So it's like anything, supply and demand, you know, there just got to be too many mink on the world market. And now guys are, because it takes them about, I had a good friend in Minnesota, that raised a lot of mink, him and his two boys. I've known him back when I retired about nine years ago. Wife and I took a trip to British Columbia with him and his wife on a bear and a moose hunt. This guy, he's, his blood's richer than Denny's. He was, I met him through the auction house because he was a mink rancher that was on the board of directors. But he'd always call me, Denny, hey, boys and I are going to Argentina to hunt red stag. And I'd go, nah, how about we're going to Greenland to hunt, you know, muskox? No, I don't think so, John. But anyway, when I retired, I told my wife, I want to go with John to British Columbia and hunt a moose and a black bear with him. So we did, but I told my buddies at work, John and his two boys used to raise 50,000 mink, produce 50,000 a year. They had a lot of workers, you know, automated <laughs> machines, and I, I got to be pretty good friends with him. I said, John, how much does it cost to raise a mink? Oh, I've got about 30 to $35 food cost in raising a mink. Because a mink born in like March or April, it's going to be harvested by December. They can grow them that fast. But anyway, I, and in those days, 10 years ago, he was averaging $80 on his mink. So he's making about $40 profit on 50,000 mink. And like I told my buddies, my buddy, a couple of my buddies said, God, Danny, that's $200,000. 
I said, you're not a very good mathematician, man. You forgot a zero. Put it on the calculator and go, oh my gosh, two million dollars. I said, now you hit the right decimal spot of what this guy and his family is making. So I mean, it used to be big, big money, you know. But now they're selling mink at twenty, thirty dollars below production cost. So most of our mink guys have pelted out all their animals and, and gone out of it, which is good. That's what the market needs. Sure. So is there still a hmm. mink market? I mean, I thought PETA took care of a lot of that. Well, some, I mean, they, they did a lot, you know, and then the other thing that's hurt our mink market is COVID has got into ranch mink, you know, the workers supposedly, I don't know all deep, but the workers essentially gave it to the mink, and so like in Finland and that, they used to raise lots of mink, they decimated all the ranch mink in some of those Netherland countries. Sure. Yep, you bet. <laughs> My grandson managed a ranch, mink ranch farm near Jessup, Iowa. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, they sold all of theirs to China. Yep, that's where a lot but of our mink. Yep. PETA came through a couple times, opened up all the cages, yep. let them out. <laughs> that's exactly and what happened to my friend up in. Those, those uh, animals don't know how to get food exactly. on Exactly. So if they stayed out too long, they died. Most of them would come back on their own. You're right. But the Sent others the died. Yep, yep. But they they're out of business. Yep. They, they closed yep. down. You're right. That, that's what's happening. All that. Glad to hear that. You know, or your story. But yeah, that's happening all over the country. Is those kind of stories. And like I say, it just makes me sick when they go and let all the cages, and most of them get killed on the road or starved to death because they don't know how to fend for themselves. Like I say, so. Yep, you bet. Um, I was going to ask you a question about the beaver. Yeah. When they're like two, they start having babies. Mm -hmm. do, they yep. make, do they mate for life? Yep, as a rule. And, yep. and can they have young until they die? Yep. Go on forever. Yep. Mm -hmm. and they tell Unless a mean old trapper like Denny catches one. <laughs> they got to wait till Valentine's Day and go find another mate. <laughs> yep. But another thing about beavers, I've said, they have what they call non determinate growth. So there's never a ceiling on how big a beaver can be. They're growing their whole life. So that's why I've seen pictures and say northern Wisconsin, somebody's caught a beaver, weighed 110 pounds. You know, they just keep growing and growing. But basically after about 10, 12, 13 years, that's getting towards the end of the beaver's life cycle. I should, I don't have it, but I donated it to the Bellevue Nature Center there. And I've only caught a couple, but I tell guys, I should have even brought a beaver skull. Beavers have got two big orange incisor teeth on the bottom and the top, and they're beveled, so every time they chew on a tree, it's sharpening the bottom ones and it's grinding down and sharpening the top ones. That's And every day of a beaver's life, his teeth, his bottoms are growing and his tops are growing. So every once in a while I've caught a beaver that his teeth have gone all the way up into his brain and he's just near death. I mean, his, his teeth are exaggerated six, eight inches. Now that beaver, once he gets sick or quits chewing and his teeth start growing, he can't even open up his mouth and he's just got a slow death until that tooth grows all the way into his brain and that's what's going to kill him. But I've boiled out a couple of those skulls. Usually it's a big giant beaver, absolutely no fat on him. And he's just probably within days or weeks of dying. But anyway, that's why I tell people you can't ever be a lazy animal if you're a beaver because your teeth are always growing and that's why you need to be, and that happens to mice, all rodents, mice, rabbits, squirrels, every day of their life their teeth are slowly growing because they're always nibbling on a nut like a squirrel and it's grinding down their teeth. So if their teeth dip in no time at all, he wouldn't hardly have any teeth left. So that's just nature's way of replenishing it. But just one more kind of cool little thing about how beavers go. But. Yep. So, so beavers, all beavers make lodges? Nope. Like you said. I, my, my, my beavers out in the river, I say my beavers, but our beavers out in the river, they, they uh, most of them will make a, a lodge either on the bank or maybe out from the shore a little bit. But say if I trap the Makoka River, almost never see a lodge. They're always in the bank and they just burrow into the bank, hollow out a cavity and mud it down. And that's where my wife, Trace, when she rides along, I mean, a couple of our farms this year, 20, 30 feet from the edge of the creek bank, here's a three, four, five foot hole down six, eight foot. That's the beavers have come out of that stream, burrowed in the bank, maybe four or five feet, but now the bank collapsed. So that's why farmers don't like it when they're out driving their combine. 
they're going to break an axle or drop a tire down in one of these three, four foot caverns that goes down six, eight foot, you know, so that's just the way the thing does. So have you found strange things in beaver dams? And I ask because somebody brought in a pair of blue jeans that, really? that had been all all woven into a beaver. Hmm. Oh, yeah. No, I guess I, 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 the only thing that brings back memories of, of years ago when I was at Bellevue, there's a, a beach below our fisheries <coughs> station there. It's the first boat ramp just south of our lock and dam. But anyway, the first island out there, all us locals call it Sneaker Beach. And the reason we call it Sneaker Beach is probably 30, 40 years ago, a family's out there walking the beach, having a good old time when their kids finds a shoe. Mom, hey, look at this shoe. Guys, it stinks. Oh no, there's toes down in this shoe. It was from a dead body. Somebody had drowned and decomposed. And so that's why us locals call it Sneaker Beach because they found a pair of tennis shoes with still the toes in the, in the sneaker. You know, kind of morbid, but that's how that, that beach got its name, you know. So, but yeah, I've never found something like that in a beach dam. And I don't think I want to. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the mountain men would maybe find one of their buddies' skulls or something. <laughs> you know, no, they better get out of Dodge or the engines don't want them around. But, yeah. Well, what's that? What about raccoons? <laughs> oh, we got lots and lots of raccoons around. But yeah. they're coming up for food. Is what you probably got cat food, something like that around as a rule. And here's something when she brought up raccoons. Here's the bad thing about raccoons: if they're gonna say if raccoons are living here, they're gonna go usually up on a log, or they're gonna have a set spot as a rule where they have their latrine or their outhouse where they're gonna take a dump. And if this was a raccoon's turd, there's roundworm cyst or eggs in there. It's very dangerous to humans or kids because if a young kid is touching this at all, we know kids love to eat candy or whatever. They, these little eggs are in this raccoon's feces. It, it hatches out in a human. A lot of times they will go into their eyes or their brains, these little roundworms. So there's getting to be a few more of those cases around the United States just because we have so many raccoons around, you know, and they're in somebody's attic or they're out in the barn where the kids are going out to play and we never used to have those problems so yeah raccoons are and like this year my wife was with me we probably killed four or five several days i'd be setting traps just making a set and i'd look up and hear from the photographer here's a raccoon middle of the day just looking at me and i just pull out my pistol and shoot that raccoon because that's not natural for a raccoon to be out in the middle of the day and usually what it is, they're all glassy-eyed, they're kind of falling over. That's the, the main sign of distemper. It's a type of disease. They get feline distemper and canine distemper. But that's what happens when there gets to be too many raccoons. Mother Nature's way of, of dealing with it. And then ray, rabies is another one that, that comes into play. So that's why we really need to harvest our animals. Sure. We, a few years ago, we had a, one of our dogs got in a fight with a raccoon. Yep. Got, you know, I don't know what the real name is, but raccoon paralysis. Oh, did it really? And yep. he was, you know, pretty much paralyzed. No kid. And we were able to save him, but I mean, he yep. could walk. That's going to start walk. being more and more common story. You know, that's yeah. what I tell people. Even with our coyotes being overpopulated, that's yeah. nature's way of either giving them rabies, that will kill them off, or mm -hmm. it's terrible when fox and coyote get mange. I haven't seen that in a while, but mm -hmm. there's another one. It's a mite that eats all their fur. You know, I used to predator call coyotes with a swing rabbit call in the snow and shoot them. And at times I'd look at the coyote 100 yards away and think, what is that? It's not even a coyote. He'd have a tuft of fur on the back of his tail, and the rest of him looked like a poodle that had been shaved. Here it is the middle of winter, and he has no fur on him. You know, he's just shivering and shaking. He's trying to find food. That's nature's way of killing them off, but a, a slow way to go when they lose all their fur like that. Yep. Well, did I answer everybody's questions on about everything today? <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you know when you buy perfume, ask the lady, is that beaver caster or just man-made perfume?